Is anyone can drive roads out there? Five feet is the middle on either side. I see. Five feet is the middle on either side. 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 Five feet
preliminary work, which might not be at the point where you can send it to a standard conference or a journal, but it's a very good place to try out your stuff and make friends. So I should build a stronger community of research within the department. Any questions? Thanks. If you have, by the way, if you have something that you want to send to the list, you could do that as well, like a paragraph or whatever. Yeah, we usually send that to all CS grads. Okay. All right, so hopefully you have now read the first two chapters, namely the prologue, which probably ought to be called Chapter 0, and Chapter 2 called the basics. And so what do we talk about in the basics? So the idea is that problems have inherent complexity. And the inherent complexity of a problem, as I think I said something about it in a hurry during the very first day when I was giving an overview of the course, so the inherent complexity of a problem is the running time, or it's the running time if time is what you're worried about. It could be or the memory or whatever else of the best algorithm. Best meaning most efficient in terms of whichever thing you care about. Again, time or memory or whatever else. I mean, the fastest algorithm could, it's quite possible that the fast algorithm is not the most efficient in terms of memory and vice versa. But once you decide what you're trying to optimize for, what measure of complexity or what computational resource it is that you only have a limited amount of, time, memory, other examples are in distributed computation where a bunch of independent people are trying to compute something together. An important computational resource would be the total number of bits that you need to send back and forth to each other. That's kind of interesting. That's not the same as running time. It's not the same as memory. It's a different resource which might be limited, like the amount of the bandwidth or the amount of whatever it is that's limiting the total amount of information that you and your partners can share. Once you decide which computational resource it is that you care about, then a given problem has some inherent complexity. And it's not the best algorithm you know about. It's the best algorithm that's out there somewhere. So, you know, I don't know if you're mathematical Platonists or not. So, you know, Platonists believe that mathematical constructs are real in some sense. So the existence or nonexistence of an algorithm that solves a problem within a certain amount of time or a certain amount of memory is a mathematical fact. It's not a subjective question about our own abilities as programmers. It's certainly not a subjective question about how powerful the computers are that are on our desks at the moment. It's an objective mathematical question about how hard is this problem to solve. And, you know, one of the nice things is that we often don't know yet what the best algorithm is. Often we think we have the best algorithm, and then it turns out that there's a much better one. Sometimes this makes such a big difference that something that's a problem that we thought would take exponential time turns out to only take polynomial time. And this is part of why it's exciting. Because if you have an algorithm that you know right now, so known algorithms give upper bounds, right? Because if I have an algorithm that solves something within, say, n cubed time, then I know that the inherent complexity is at most n cubed. There could be an n squared or an n log n or something algorithm out there that I don't know about. So the problem is that lower bounds are hard to prove, which is partly why we still don't know that p and np are different. And, you know, because it's very hard to know that you have the best algorithm. How would you prove that? You know, how do you know that there isn't some clever way to solve the problem which runs a lot faster? 
So um, here's, a, you know, here's a classic case that we go through in that chapter. So, uh, and it's one of the oldest algorithms known. And I know that many of you know it, but it's worth going over again. So I want to know the greatest common denominator of uh, two numbers, right? They're the largest, uh, the largest number that divides them both. Great, greatest common divisor, I'm sorry, not denominator. Euclid's algorithm is, in a sense, recursive, although, as you know from your programming courses, you never really need to use recursion. You could always use fours and whiles instead. But often, recursion is the most elegant way to write things. So here's uh, Euclid's algorithm. Here's a little comment. I'll assume that uh, A is less than B. I, I either assumed that or the other way around in the book. I forget which. What? Whether you're equal. Oh, well, if they're equal, uh, okay, I'll say A is less than B. Okay. All right, so. Well, what do we do in a recursive algorithm? First of all, there's a base case, which is that if A is 0, then I'll just return B, because everything divides 0. So the GCD of 0 and B is B. <coughs> Otherwise, call the function again, but now replace B with A, and replace A with B mod A. Okay. Right. How many of you could have written this down without being reminded? Anyone? Maybe after a little bit of trial and error? Um, so just for kicks, uh, you know, if I say the lowest, the, the GCD of 100 and 625, well, I would turn this into 100 and 625 mod 100, which is 25. And then uh, 100 mod 25 is 0. And then the base case would kick in, and it would return 25, which is the right answer. Okay. All right. Now, um, this establishes that finding the greatest common divisor of oh, the curly bracket, finding the greatest common divisor of two integers can be done pretty quickly, but let's decide what we mean. So um, when I have integer problems, I'm going to care about the number of digits. So basically, I'm going to assume that a and b are n digit numbers or n bit numbers. I, I, you know, I don't really care about the difference between bits and digits. And um, so I would like to establish that the running time is polynomial <coughs> as a function of n, the number of bits or digits, which of course is very different from as a function of the numbers themselves because they can be, they're exponentially large as a function of the number of digits. Okay. So when I talk about questions involving integers like factoring, can I factor a number or can I tell whether a number is prime? If I uh, you know, if I want to know whether I can do this efficiently, I'll always mean as a function of the number of bits or digits of the number. Because after all, remember that the, the size of the input to a problem is the size of the email or whatever I need to send you to describe it to you. Okay? All right. So um, prove to me um, that if I run this recursive algorithm, that the depth of the recursion, the number of steps it it, the number of times it calls itself before it hits the base case and returns the answer is big O of n. So if we can prove that the number of times it calls itself before returning the answer is only linear in the number of digits, then we'll basically have shown that the total running time is polynomial as long as we can show that this particular line here, taking b mod a, can also be done in polynomial time. And let's just assume that for now. Okay. So 
the heart of the algorithm is showing that for n digit numbers, I only need to recurse or recur or whatever the right verb is, order n times. So how would you prove that? I'll erase this very slowly so you have time to come up with the answer. B mod A is always less than B divided by 2. Well, that's true, yes. So B mod A is less than or equal to B divided by 2. So that means we have recursion relation where it's like T of n equals T of n divided by 2 plus some constant. First of all, does everyone agree with this? So for any A less than or equal to B, B mod A is less than or equal to B over 2. In fact, it's less than B over 2. That doesn't really matter. I'm getting a critical mass of nodding heads, but I don't want people who would like to see a proof to be embarrassed. Would anyone like to see a proof? I don't mind doing one. And the point is that A is either bigger than B over 2, in which B mod A is that part and is less than B over 2, or is less than B over 2, but then it divides into B at least twice, and so on. So now what this means is that, so if I start out with A over B, then this thing here will be B over 2, but now on the next step, I can apply the same argument, and A mod B over 2 will now be at most A over 2. So whenever I do two steps of this recursion, both things have gone down by a factor of 2, which means that if they're n bits long, the number of steps of recursion I need to do is at most 2n, which is big O of n. The mod part, I don't feel like doing it. I mean, it's basically long division, and I think you'll believe me when I say that I can calculate the one n bit number mod the other in polynomial time in n. So this algorithm is, I don't know, 2,500 years old or so. It was originally presented, since Euclid was a geometer, it was presented in finding the greatest common divisor of two lengths, and his idea about taking mod was you would take this thing here and lay it out again until this was less than it, and that's the mod. Of course, that's a rather inefficient way to take mod, right? That's like saying that to find B mod A, you should subtract A a bunch of times until the result is less than A. Is that a polynomial time algorithm? Are you sure? I mean, you know, I mean, let's say that I have one number which is roughly a million and another number which is roughly a thousand. So B is roughly 10 to the sixth, A is roughly 10 to the three. How many times will I have to subtract A from B before I get down to something which is less than A? About a thousand. About B divided by A. But that, you know, that could be exponentially large, right? That could be, right? So it's important that we do something much cleverer than just repeatedly subtracting. I mean, that's inefficient for the same reason that adding A to itself B times is an inefficient way to multiply A times B. Okay. Because if B is exponentially large, it will take you exponential time. And when I say exponentially large, I mean it has a thousand digits, so it's about 10 to the thousand or two to the thousand. Okay. So the fact that the GCD is so easily computable, so indeed it is in this class P, 
where p is the class we can, of problems that we can solve in polynomial time as a function of the size of the input, where again, size here means the length, the number of bits or digits I need to specify the input. So we've just proven, uh, sorry, we've just proved um, that GCD is NP. This is kind of interesting because you know that finding the greatest common divisor has a lot to do with the factors of these numbers. So here's another way to find the greatest common divisor. Factor these two numbers. Um, this one is 5 to the fourth. And this one is 2 squared times 5 squared. And now you see that there's two common factors of 5 and the GCD is 25. Ah, but it turns out that factoring in digit numbers is not something that we know how to do efficiently. Okay? As far as we know, factoring is not in P, which is one of the reasons why public key cryptography is currently secure. So um, it's kind of interesting that GCD is so easy, given that actually factoring a number into its prime factors appears to be hard. I think that's kind of interesting. Say the, the problems have are from kind of the same area of mathematics that have a similar flavor, and yet this one is much easier than, as far as we know, the other one is. But again, we don't know that factoring isn't in P. We just haven't found a polynomial time algorithm for it yet. Maybe we're just all blockheads, and you know, some clever person tomorrow will figure out how to do it. It's hard to prove lower bounds. All right, so any questions about JCD before I continue? Yes. I have just one question. You just mentioned about public key cryptography. Yes. Is it, do you mean that the when n equals to pq and pq are the relatively primes, n is known and pq are not known, so it's difficult to find what are p and q? Yes. That's what you mean. Oh. Well, so uh, yeah. So the question is, if n is the product of two large primes, and I tell you n, can you find p and q? And currently, we do not know any way to solve that in time, which is polynomial as a function of the number of digits of n. By the way, I'm often going to use capital N when I mean a large number, but I'll try to be consistent so that little n will be the number of digits or bits, so that capital N is roughly 2 to the little n or 10 to the little n. So in general, I'll use little n to mean the size of the problem. So, so GCD is in terms of e, right? Yes. Is that you said NP, <laughs> I'm kind of confused. Uh, I meant to say in P. In P. Oh, yes. in P. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. All right. So um, let's see. What about multiplication? Let's do multiplication. I know these are very simple, possibly boring examples, but there's a nice story to tell about multiplication. And of course, you all already know this story since you did the reading. But I'll remind you. So suppose I have two n-digit numbers and I want to <coughs> multiply them together. So I want to multiply this by this. So what is the grade school method? Well, um, the grade school method is you write down this times 6 down here. I guess I need to carry a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well. Um, and then four. Oh, sorry. Seven. Good, thank you. <laughs> and then this. And then I add them all up. Adding is easy. <laughs> okay, all right. So the point is that if these are n digit integers, then just by looking at the amount of ink I've used, you can tell that this procedure takes something like n cubed time. Okay? Yeah. It's squared. Sorry, n squared. <laughs> so, um, you know, the adding part is not so hard. Not so hard. What matters is that roughly, you know, n squared times I did, uh, you know, a lookup in my stored one digit by one digit multiplication table. And this is such a simple method that you might think it's the best method, and it does demonstrate that the inherent complexity of multiplying two n digit numbers is at most quadratic in n. The question is, can we do any better? And it turns out that we can, using another one of the major types of algorithms, namely what's called divide and conquer, which I know many of you are already familiar with. 
So let me just say these things, even if you already know them. The point about divide and conquer algorithms is that sometimes we can divide a problem into pieces and solve the pieces in a way which is nearly independent from each other, and then do a little bit of extra work to combine the pieces into the complete answer. So let's say that I have a really big n-digit number called x, and I'm going to divide it into two n over two digit numbers. And so the first half I'll call x1, and I'm going to have 10 to the n over 2 times x1, and then the second half is x2. So this is the most significant half, and that's the least significant half. Okay, and I multiply by 10 to the n over 2 to shift this over. So, I mean, this is just an n over 2 digit number. I multiply by that to shift it over. So is this format clear? Similarly, I can write y in this form. And now I want to calculate xy. So what is xy? Well, it's 10 to the n times x1, y1, plus 10 to the n over 2 times x1, y2, plus x2, y1, and then finally it's plus x2, y2. Did I miss something? X1, X2. Oh, sorry. X1, Y1. Thank you. All right. Well, this looks exciting. So what this says is that if you know how to multiply n over two digit numbers together, with a little bit of extra work, you can multiply n digit numbers together. Okay, this this looks like we're on the right track. What this means is we can design a recursive algorithm which in, order, which in order to multiply x and y, divide them into halves, multiplies these different combinations of halves, and then adds them together. I know that we're also <coughs> multiplying by these powers of 10, but that's easy. You just add zeros at the end. And if we were doing this in phase 2, it would, that would be easy to multiply by powers of 2. Um, so that part is kind of negligible, I'm going to claim. And I'm going to claim that the job of adding things together is also pretty easy. So I'm just going to focus on um, the recursive part of the running time, the fact that I have to do these four products. And I'm going to define t of n as the time it takes to multiply a pair of n-digit numbers together. And so what I have here is that ignoring <coughs> what I claim is the time it takes to do these easy, these easy things, the, the multiplying by powers of 10 and the addition, t of n is, let's see, I have to do four products, so it's 4 times t of n over 2. All right. What is the solution to this recurrence? What function gets quadrupled whenever its input gets doubled? Square. So, oh darn it, that's what we already had. Rats. So this didn't give us any improvement at all. Hmm. Um, well, let's see if we can do something slightly more clever. Um, and uh, so, this, the following wasn't really noticed until like 1960 or so. Right? Because it wasn't until people had computers on their desks that they started doing things like multiplying really large integers and started wondering if there were smarter ways to do it. So um, the following could have and should have been done by the Greeks or the Ottomans or the Babylonians, but they weren't thinking along these lines, so they didn't ever consider this sort of question about the computational difficulty of large things, because when you're a mere human, you do big computations until, you know, you fall over or whatever, and then that's all you can do. You tend not to think about the asymptotics. But, um, so anyway, here's the idea. Consider the following. If I take x1 plus x2 and multiply it by y1 plus y2 and multiply this out, I get the following stuff. Now notice 
this is one of the products we wanted, and so is this. And notice that we don't actually need these two products separately. We only need their sum. And here it is. So the point is that if you calculate this product, this one, and this one, you can get this one very cheaply just by subtracting these two from this. Okay. So again, neglecting the time that addition and subtraction takes, and I claim that they're pretty easy. Specifically, I claim that for n-digit numbers, you can do addition and subtraction and only order n time, which is negligible when n is large compared to n squared. Well, now the number of products I need is only 3 times d to the n versus 2. I mean, the number of products I need to do is now only 3. So this changes my recurrence. And now, what is the solution? Yes. Log n to the log base 2 of 3. I leave this to you to prove. Um, but so now we've gotten this down to n to the 1.585 or so. Right. So I know that uh, this isn't about going from exponential time to polynomial time. It's about from going from one polynomial to a better polynomial. But it's still pretty nice. Because I think that if I just showed you this method and asked you, if you'd never thought about the problem before, I asked you for a more efficient method, you might really have a strong intuition that there's no avoiding a quadratic amount of work. You might have a strong intuition that we really sort of have to write out this entire table, which is, after all, the product of all n squared combinations of these digits. And you might think that there's no getting around that. But there is. And in fact, this is not the best algorithm either. By dividing uh, the number into more parts, you can bring this exponent down farther. And in the limit of all this, there is actually a clever way to view the product of two long strings of integers as a convolution of two functions. And if you're an electrical engineer or if you've taken 530, you know that uh, you can convolve two functions by taking the Fourier transforms, multiplying the Fourier transforms together, and then Fourier transforming back. And as we'll talk about uh, sometime soon, I will review the fast Fourier transform, which works in only n log n time. There's a little bit of extra work that you need to do, which is really just bookkeeping. It's the sort of factor that I'm not even, I'm definitely not going to pay attention to in this class. But the point is that you can multiply two n-digit numbers in nearly linear time, right? So except for these log terms, it's linear in n. And one way to put this is that this is little o of n to the 1 plus epsilon for any epsilon bigger than 0. And to say that in English, we can get this exponent arbitrarily close to 1. By the way, I'm going to assume that you know what the symbols big O, little o, big theta, and big omega mean. If you need a review, email me or do the reading. Um, I'm happy to explain it if you forgot or if you never learned. OK, good. So that's the, that's the divide and conquer idea. So um, I already talked about this a little bit on the first day, but for the purposes of theory, why do, we, why do we focus on polynomial versus exponential time? Well, part of it is that as you start getting into the details of algorithms, at some point, the, the ideas fade away, and the details of the implementations really matter. So for instance, this term here, this is a data structure term. It's a bookkeeping term, right? So. These things are important when you're really trying to optimize algorithms, but somehow the large scale idea is this divide and conquer business, or the fancier idea of the, or of the Fourier transform, if you really want to get all the way down here. And we want to focus on the large scale ideas. So we don't want to worry about the details of what kind of memory access you have. We don't want to worry about the details of the data structures we use. Um, we don't want to worry about the details of how a graph is presented to you, in what format, 
whether it's a, a matrix of zeros and ones or a list of edges or whatever. And the nice thing about polynomial time is it's robust with respect to all these things. Okay, so I sort of said that on the first day. At this point, do I need to elaborate any further on that? Or? Okay, so going back to our the problems we talked about in the first week, the Hamiltonian path and the, and the Eulerian path, visiting every vertex once or crossing every edge once, roughly speaking, a problem is in P if we have a clever way to avoid an exhaustive search. And we believe that for some problems there's no way to avoid an exhaustive search. And um, so <coughs> that's kind of the question. So the question is if I, I have some if I have some complicated problem, is there some algorithmic key, some insight I can use, like divide and conquer, for instance, which somehow breaks the problem into manageable pieces, or helps me zero in on a solution, or in any case lets me skip having to search through the space, the entire space of possible solutions. So what I want to do um, for the rest of this week is kind of briefly review some of the other algorithmic tools we have that take problems that look at first as if they might require exponential time, but instead solve them in polynomial time. And one of the interesting things is that we actually, we don't know of very many families of algorithms. So I know that algorithms is a vast field, right? But when it comes right down to it, we only know of a few um, techniques that we just apply over and over again. So let's write a few of them down. So we already talked about divide and conquer. I guess even though it's a very general idea, we should include recursion. What are some other families of algorithms? Sorry? Dynamic programming, which is kind of one of the, maybe one of the most interesting, although it's one of the most poorly named. I mean, this is a completely uninformative phrase. Greedy. And greedy algorithms are another. But greedy doesn't guarantee the optimal solution. Well, exactly. So none of these, none of these always work, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. For some problems, a greedy approach works. For some problems, a dynamic programming approach works. For some problems, none of these work. Right? So, sorry? NP-hard algorithms. Yeah, I mean, so so what <coughs> we'll end up with is uh, there'll be a number of problems for which none of these ideas work, and then we'll use the idea of NP-completeness to try to explain, to try to give some evidence that it's not just a lack of cleverness on our part, that maybe these other problems are really hard. But for now, I, I want to focus on why certain problems turn out to be easy, why certain problems are in P. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see, I didn't bring the book with me. And uh, I've emptied much of my brain into the book, so now there's lots of things that I don't know anymore. Um, <laughs> were, there any other, were there any other really major algorithmic ideas? I guess heuristic, maybe it's part of heuristic error. Well, heuristic is a very general phrase, though. I mean, heuristic sort of means any kind of down and dirty trick you can do. And I mean, but also heuristics, as it, the word heuristic typically means an algorithm where we can't prove very much about its success. And where, in fact, we don't claim that it always works, just that it often works in practice. So that's probabilistic algorithms. We will, so we will talk about randomized algorithms. So let's let's put those down here. So um, there's one other thing that I should mention, um, which doesn't fit too directly into these, although it is a kind of greedy algorithm. But it sort of deserves it actually deserves its own thing, which is um, min cut and max flow. And this has to do with a pretty deep idea called um, linear programming and duality. 
that's probably the deepest idea that, that we have, actually, in our current arsenal of algorithmic ideas. We'll talk about that. And then there's another very general idea called reduction. And a reduction is just a transformation of one problem to another. And it's sort of a meta idea. It says that, well, you know, if you already have a good algorithm for problem B and you can change an example of problem A into an example of problem B, now you can solve problem A, as long as, as, long as the process of doing that transformation is itself not too complicated. Um, so, of course, this doesn't work unless one of these other ideas have already worked for problem B. But it's a good thing to have in your pocket. So I, I want to emphasize this fact that, um, you know, so in, in modern terms, we've only been thinking about algorithms for, to be generous, maybe 60 or 70 years. So it may be that there are other very basic types of algorithms that would be taught in all the standard courses 100 years from now. Uh, but, you know, there's actually not that many. Okay. Um, that we know so far. All right, so uh, let's talk about greedy algorithms. And so, by the way, how many of you have already taken 561 here, which is the computer science course on graduate algorithms? Okay, well, most. And how many have taken some other course on algorithms somewhere else? Okay, good. So this, this should be review. But I, I do want to take the time to review it because um, theorists have an ad theorists have a reputation for only proving that things are hard, um, which is sort of viewed as not very helpful to the rest of the world. But that's not that's not a fair reputation. We theorists like to think about why some things are hard and other things are easy, and we want to try to understand the boundary between those two. And we can't do that without understanding why these ideas work sometimes so that we can understand why in other circumstances they don't work. So uh, what is the classic problem that I'm about to talk about for greedy algorithms? Knapsack. Knapsack. Yeah. Knapsack. Knapsack. Oh, knapsack? Oh, no, I don't like knapsack. What's the other <laughs> Time management. Uh, Minimum spanning tree. tree. Minimum spanning tree, yes. yes. Oh, I, I don't like all these industrial examples. Of, you know, <laughs> scheduling and so on. And there's one modern text where every darn pr homework problem starts out, you and a friend are, are starting a web startup company and blah, 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 blah. I, just, I, I want more beauty than that. So, you know, yes, I, I, I wish that I was terribly wealthy. <laughs> then again, I get summers off. So, um, all right, so minimum spending. Uh, okay, so this, al this problem has a very nice provenance. It goes back to the 1920s. There's lots of little historical tidbits in my book. You really should read it. <laughs> so back in the 1920s, in the, in the, uh, the region of Bohemia, there was a guy who was trying to design, um, this was, a, you know, electric power utilities were just starting up, and he wanted to design a minimum cost uh, network for, of electric cables that would reach a set of towns. So the setting is I have a set of, I have a set of cities with distances between them, um, or maybe not necessarily distances, but actually the cost of laying a cable between them which isn't just based on the distance. Maybe there's a mountain in between or something, so it would cost more. But let's abstract this. Let's instead say that I have a graph. It doesn't have to be a complete graph. Maybe not all of the pairs of cities are even feasible to the cable between them. It's not necessarily planar, the crossings. And each edge in this graph has a weight, which is the cost that it would take me to lay a cable between that pair of cities. So I have a weighted graph. Okay. And what I want to do, oh, they took away my blue marker. For what? Darn it. Okay. Fine. What I want to do is find a spanning tree. 
something like this um, that touches every vertex of the graph. Um, and so what might you do? Uh, so here's the greedy strategy. There are actually many different greedy strategies, which are come under various names like Krim's algorithm and Preskell's algorithm. Um, but uh, well, let's choose one. And it's called Prim's algorithm, although he wasn't actually the first discoverer, but it's still called that. So start with a simple <laughs> vertex. It doesn't, let's pretend it doesn't matter which one we start with. Indeed, it, that'll turn out to be true. And then repeatedly, you know, do until you have a tree. Add the cheapest edge, the lowest cost edge, that doesn't complete a cycle. Right? So let's say this is the tree you have so far. Well, there's no point in adding this edge, because in this admittedly quite unrealistic model of electric power grids, um, we're assuming that I only need to reach each city by one path. It's not a very uh, robust grid if there were failures, but let's assume this is the situation. So basically, add the cheapest edge, which extends outward from the vertices you've already touched to some vertex you haven't touched yet. So what happens is that the you know the boundary of your tree grows, and at each point you extend things outward along that boundary on the cheapest possible edge. Okay, so this is a well-defined strategy, and Philosophically, it's a strategy you could, you could apply to many different problems. Here's an interesting problem. Um, optimize for the political, economic, social, and environmental health of the planet 100 years from now. Here's a greedy strategy. This year, do what seems best at the moment. Um, so, uh, well, you know, so for lots of problems, greedy strategies don't work. For lots of problems, it's important to do some kind of long-range look ahead. And for many problems, there's really, you know, it's a global optimization problem. You can't, you can't just do the best thing in this part of the problem because that could screw up something in some distant part of the problem. And you need to weigh and balance things against each other. And it's just life is much more complicated. But for some problems, greed works. And this is one of them. And it's not completely obvious, but there's this little lemma that I know you've all seen. So we'll briefly prove that little lemma. And the lemma goes like this. So, um, so let's say, let's, let's give some names to things. I have a set of vertices V and a set of edges E. And the weights on the edges, I'll call W of E. So those are our weights. I'm going to assume that they're non-negative. So that you, you know, although there are versions of the problem where that doesn't matter as much. Um, and, okay, so now here's a little lemma. And you could call it the greed will never steer you wrong lemma. Okay. Um, so for any subset of the set of vertices, so you know these are, so let S be the set of vertices that you've already reached. Okay. Um, let E be an edge that crosses from S to you know, the rest, the other vertices, what's your favorite notation? V minus S or V slash S or just S bar. Let's call it S bar. So the, the other vertices, okay, which among these has lowest weight? I'm not saying it's unique. There might be other edges from S to the complement of S that have equally low weight, but it's one of the lowest weight ones. Um, then, 
there exists a minimum spanning tree, by which I mean one of the spanning trees which touches every vertex of the lowest possible weight. That includes E. And E is the edge that you add at each step. So the point is that adding this cheapest edge, it never gets you off the path to a minimum spanning tree. Now, there are probably many different minimum spanning trees, but if you just keep adding the cheapest edge, it will always lead you to one of them. There will be a minimum spanning tree waiting at the end of that process. All right, so how do we prove this? And again, I know many of you know this, but so here's what we have. In fact, in theory, you all know this, since you should remember from that course. So here's S, and here's the other vertices, and let's say here's this edge. And it's a proof by contradiction. Okay. Somebody tell me the proof. Yes? So that there's another edge E that connects the set of S to the S bar. Yes. And for sure this other edge E will be either equal or greater than the weight of E. Yes. So if it's greater than, it couldn't be in the minimum spanning tree because it's greater. So the total weight would be greater than the weight of the frequency of the E. Well, but I don't think you've quite, I don't think that's a proof. I mean, right, how do you know? I mean, isn't it possible that even if the weight of this other edge E prime is greater, how do you know that I don't somehow benefit in the long term by including this edge? Maybe that makes it possible for me to build the rest of the tree in a different way so that the total cost is less. Well, it's like it's connecting two connected components. So S is a connected component, and that other part is connected. So now we need to connect both these components, and why not use the smallest possible edge E? Because maybe it's better not to. I mean, for instance, let me point out that if you change the word tree to the word tour, right, so that now I have a bunch of cities with edges between them, and now I want to visit them all in a linear path of lowest weight. This is the traveling salesman problem. And for this problem, the greedy strategy fails miserably, right? For this problem, if you have gotten this far on the path, it is often the right idea to take a very expensive edge instead of a cheap one because it leads you to a place where then the rest of the path will be cheaper and the total cost will be lower. So there's something about trees where the greedy strategy works, even though tours, the greedy strategy doesn't work. So, I mean, just so you have to be careful when you make an argument that it's not an argument which would apply equally well here because here we know this strategy doesn't work. Each edge connects two components and is a bridge between those two components. There's no two edges to connect. Well, but that's true in that tour also. Each edge connects sort of the stuff before it, the stuff after it. Do you mean that if we add another one edge in this minimum spending tree, then it will be a cycle, so that it's not true, right? Yeah, so now you're remembering a little bit more of the proof. So, yes, so let's follow that proof. It's a proof by contradiction. So let's say that the minimum spending tree looks like this. And now it has to touch this vertex somehow. So if it doesn't use this edge, it has to go around somehow and meet that in some other way. 
I've drawn this path so that it doesn't revisit here, but actually the path could sort of go back and forth a couple times across this boundary. But one way or the other, we have to get from here to touch that. Okay? So we're going to prove things by contradiction. Suppose that this were the cheapest spanning tree. Now prove to me that it isn't. Following what you said? What? Because we have a path that is smaller. We're using this of this age. Right. So what we could do is we could mutate the spanning tree to a better one. By adding this edge. Now if you add an edge to a spanning tree, as you say, it has a cycle. But now I could cut this edge. Now I reach everywhere I reached before, but I do it using E instead of E prime. All the other edges which were there are still there, but the total cost has gone down because I replaced E prime with E. So that's the idea of the proof. Now I sort of, to totally tighten this up, I mean, you know, we need to deal with the fact of multiple edges with the same cost. But the moral is this, that if the most expensive spanning tree, sorry, if the least expensive spanning tree used this edge, we could replace it with this one. Okay. Which is what I think you were trying to say before. But the point is that this argument doesn't work here. Okay. Because let's say that this is a really, I'm at this city. I visited these cities. I'm at this city. I'm trying to decide where to go next. There's a boat for, you know, five lire I could take over there, or I could buy a $600 plane ticket to go over there. Well, the problem is that I don't get to cut this edge and replace my tour with this edge. I would still get a spanning tree, but if I'm trying to find a linear tour, then I've just sort of, I've done an illegal mutation. This resulting thing is no longer a tour. But for trees, this argument works. So somehow minimum cost spanning trees are a lot easier to find than minimum cost tours because this argument works for trees and not for tours. That's kind of interesting. Okay. So another way I like to think about greedy algorithms is they're like a ball rolling downhill. So if you're an ecologist, you think about species maximizing their fitness in which they should be climbing uphill. If you're a physicist, you think about things minimizing their energy like balls rolling downhill. So you can always flip the vertical axis to change which thing you think is best or worst. But if you don't mind, let's think for a moment as a ball rolling downhill. You are trying to find the lowest valley. If you're in a complicated landscape and you only have sort of local information in which you try to change your position a little bit, a little at a time, what typically happens is you'll get stuck in a local optimum. You'll get stuck in a situation where any small change makes things worse. But if only you could see past the current situation and make a big change, you would find a much better solution over here. But that's hard because if you make little steps, you would have to make things a lot worse before you could make them get better. Or you would have to learn somehow to make big steps. But big steps in what direction? So rather than a little one-dimensional map here, if this was a very high-dimensional space of possible solutions, it's fine to say, oh, well, you should make a big step, but which big step should you make? There are kind of exponentially many directions you could go in a high-dimensional space. So it's hard to design an algorithm that does that. Somehow greedy problems are the one, the problems for which a greedy strategy works are those where the landscape really looks like that, where it's not a bumpy landscape with lots of little local optima, where there really are little moves you can make one at a time which will improve things. Now in this setup, 
We described it by building a solution from scratch. We started out with nobody touched or maybe one vertex touched, and then we added one edge at a time. But there's another algorithm which we could have done, which also works, which is a little bit more like a ball rolling downhill, which would be more like this. Start with any spanning tree. Okay? So just grab one. Connect the edges wherever you like. I don't care how expensive it is. And now do the following until you can't. Um, find, so we'll call this tree T, find an edge which is not currently in the tree such that adding E and removing some other edge E prime reduces the total cost of the tree. It's a different philosophy, but the inner, the central idea is the same. I'm still adding an edge that makes a cycle, and I'm cutting the cycle somewhere else. In this algorithm, we started with nothing and built a spanning tree edge by edge. In this algorithm, we start with a complete spanning tree, but maybe a bad one, one with a high total cost, and then we repeatedly improve it. But we're again using this idea of adding edges and then cutting cycles to get an expanding tree. And I claim that for exactly the same reason, this, this algorithm will never get stuck in a local optimum. Okay? It will always find one of the lowest cost spanning trees. Okay. Whereas if you try to do the same thing here, so a similar algorithm for this one would be, well, what are some simple moves you could make? Well, instead of visiting four cities in this order and then going on somewhere else, you could switch the order a little bit. Go, go this way and then that way and then that way. So that's an example of a small mutation that you might do to a tour in an effort to try to improve it. But in the case of tours, if you do this, then you do often get stuck in local minima. And you don't find, there's no guarantee that you'll find the optima. Well, what about the performance of this one versus the previous? Oh, I don't care. They're both polynomial time. <laughs> I mean, this is polynomial time because there's only, you know, a polynomial number of possible edges. And, uh, you know, in the current spanning tree, there's only n minus 1 edges, right? And, uh, but even if there were n cubed somehow, or n squared, it doesn't matter. It's still polynomial. Okay. In practice, this is probably faster. But there are also some other ones that are much faster than this. So another one, so this one starts with a single vertex and then grows the tree outward. But there's another algorithm which sort of grows a forest everywhere at once, which everywhere at once um, in, in parallel, if you like, adds edges, and then these, this forest grows, and as we add more edges, the trees merge until we have one big tree. And this is actually, this, this algorithm was invented in the 1920s by this guy, Borutka, who came up with the problem in the first place. And he wasn't, he didn't have any computers, right? He was an actual engineer with, well, I know people now are, I said that wrong. He was an engineer without a computer, and he was trying to do this calculation by hand, but uh, because, you know, we all have limited time on this earth, he wanted to do it efficiently. So, um, okay. So, it's interesting to think about for what problems greed works and for what problems they don't. And somehow, because of the lemma that I had written up here before, the you can't go wrong lemma, something about the structure of the set of all trees and the fact that I can get from one to another by adding an edge and then cutting a cycle, something about the structure of all tours, it's, it's a more complicated structure. It creates a bumpier landscape 
and it's harder to find the optimum. So this is sort of what, I mean, it's this sort of thing that theory is about. I mean, what is it that makes such a qualitative difference between the difficulty of these two problems? All right, so that's a great discussion. Okay, let's see. Well, I'm not sure if we have time to really get into dynamic programming yet, but maybe we can define a fun problem for dynamic programming. So where I'm in, where I'm talking now, by the way, is in chapter three. So I know some of you don't have copies of the book yet. I'm sorry, we're still figuring out how many to print, so I'll try to print a few more. But presumably everybody who's actually in the room has a copy of the book. Of course, I want everyone in the world to have a copy of the book, but I don't have the budget for that. But so chapter three is the one called Insights and Algorithms, where it goes into these various types of algorithms. It's a long chapter, but you should sort of, so pick and choose, because this isn't an algorithms course. So, I mean, read it for pleasure, as you would a nice novel or an epic poem. And, you know, but I want you to at least, if later on in the course I say, oh, this is in P because we can solve it using dynamic programming, I want you to know what I mean. Also, unfortunately, dynamic programming is usually taught very badly. It's usually taught in a needlessly complicated way about filling in tables and blah, blah, blah. So it's really just recursion with memory. It's just recursion with, it's just recursion without redoing things a zillion times. That's what it is. So you might want to read that, because maybe when you first learned it, you were intimidated by it because it was taught poorly. Not here, of course, but somewhere else. And then MnCut and XFlow, linear programming duality, this is also treated as if it's very complicated, and it's not. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit, let's just set up a problem for dynamic programming, and then we'll talk about it later. So it's a typesetting problem. So let's say that you have a string of words of various lengths. And what you want to do is gather these words into lines to make a nice looking paragraph. So let's say that the length, the width of your paragraphs is this or so. So what you might do, what you'll presumably do is put these two here, and you'll stretch out the space between them a little bit, but not too much to offend the eye. And then maybe you'll put the next on, the next three things on the next line, and then this last one, I guess you're actually allowed to have a dangling word at the end of the paragraph. Now there are several ways to do this. One is a greedy strategy, right? Just start adding words to a line until you run out of space. Okay. Well, okay, so this problem is not entirely well defined yet, because what do we mean by a good solution to this problem? Let's define the cost of a paragraph in the following way, which is pretty general. So what I'm going to do is, after I determine which words I'm going to place on which line, well, what would be a bad situation? A bad situation would be if these spaces were forced to be stretched a lot, creating ugly white space, or if they were compressed. Now, of course, one thing you could do to make things look nice is change the letter spacing, the spacing within a word. But in the words of the great type font designer, Frederick Gowdy, anyone who would change the letter spacing of lowercase would steal sheep. So it's generally agreed that letter spacing is something you play with on movie posters with big capital letters, but not in a paragraph. It just looks bad. 
causes a headache on the part of the reader. So let's assume that the length of the words stay the same, but the spaces get stretched or squashed. So what we do is once we decide where the break points are, where the line breaks are, like here we put one here and we put one here, then we're going to look at how much these spaces will have to be stretched or squashed in order to justify things onto that line. And then we'll have a total cost, C, which I'm going to write in a very general way. It's just going to be a sum over all the spaces and um, of some function of the space between the ith and i plus first work. Okay. All right. But where where this space is determined by, um, you know, where the line break. I, I'm not being very clear. Um, so here, I mean, let me say this in a much better way. Okay. So. On, on, on the elf line, so uh, do the following thing. Calculate the difference between the total white space um, or I guess, I, I guess what I really want to do is the ratio and the number of spaces. Right? What I'm trying to do is calculate the ratio by which I'm going to have to stretch things. Okay. Okay. And call this R sub L. And then I'm just, my cost will be some sum over the lines of some function of R sub L. Which is, you know, how much, how upset I am, aesthetically, about that amount of stretching. Okay. There's better notation in the book. I didn't think I was going to get to this yet today. Mm -hmm. I'll do this better on Thursday. All right. So the greenest, and, and, and by the way, this is how this book is typeset. It's how LaTeX works, right? So this wonderful program with which Donald Knuth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> completely altered the face of scientific communication. Um, it optimizes this. Okay. Now, what I want you to take home today is that this is not obviously an easy optimization problem. Because if I have a list of n words, there are exponentially many choices of where I could place these line breaks. Okay. All right. So if, if I have n words and l lines and n and l are both large, the point is there are many different places I could place those l line breaks. And maybe actually, I guess I don't know in advance how many lines the paragraph is going to be. I also want to point out that the greedy strategy fails. Okay. So there's a cute example. But the point is that if you just fill up the line, if you just keep adding words to a line until you've run out of space, and then you take the next word and put it on the next line, there are many functions, including some which I would, I would venture to say fit reasonably well with our aesthetic sense of what looks good, which the greedy strategy fails to optimize. Sometimes it's actually better. So, so suppose the line was large enough so that I could fit this word. Sometimes it's actually better to push this down onto the line below at the cost of stretching these out more, because by putting this on the line below, I can make the next several lines look much nicer. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that this optimization problem, finding the layout of the paragraph that minimizes this total cost, is a global optimization problem. Which is why sometimes when you add a word on the next to the last line of a paragraph, it changes how it types at the first line. It's really solving this problem for you know for a function that can sort of hand coded to to produce results that you like. Um, so, as you can imagine, 
we can solve this problem in polynomial time using dynamic programming. But the greedy strategy fails. And it really is important sometimes to balance one part of the problem against another. Sometimes making a sacrifice on one line helps you improve things a lot on another line. Whereas in the minimum spanning tree, that never happened. There was never any reason to sacrifice. It was OK to always be greedy in every little step to do what seemed best just locally. You never needed to think about the long-term consequences. Here you do need to think about the long-term consequences. The set of possible solutions is exponentially large. It looks as if it might be a hard optimization problem, but dynamic programming will solve it in a moment. Okay? So please take a look at chapter three. Um, again, don't feel like you are forced to read every word. Feel rather that you're choosing to read every word. And I'll see you on Thursday. <coughs> oh, and as I emailed you, unfortunately, I, for, for family and weather reasons, I have to leave. I can't do office hours today. I apologize. I will try to do some extra office hours on Thursday. I'm also, if your schedule allows, I also have office hours from 2 to 3 tomorrow. And I'll try to be extra responsive with email questions. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. 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 Okay.